On this week's Xamarin Show, I have my good friend Mike all the way from the UK on this beautiful Teams call telling us how to put C++ in your Xamarin iOS and Android apps. Tune in. Welcome back everyone to the Xamarin Show. I'm your host James Montemagno and today I have my good friend Mike Parker on from our mobile cat team, customer advisory team of awesome, talking about some C++. Mike, how's it going? Not bad, thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really excited because I don't know a lot about C++ world. I used to do a lot of C++ in game dev and I was like, I don't want to do that anymore. But I know that there's a lot of developers and customers I've talked to that have had to put C++ in. So I figured, hey, you're the guy. You're the guy that I want on to talk about it. But uh, before we go and talk about that, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? So yeah, I'm from the UK and I've been in the mobile customer advisory team for about two years now, but I've been at Microsoft a bit longer than I care to admit. <laughs> Lovely. So you spent a lot of time then with our customers that are out there building apps with Xamarin, is that about correct? <laughs> Yeah, so our team is here really to try and help customers be successful using our tools and platforms. Beautiful. So where does, I guess, C++ fall into that? Well, as you know, uh, the languages and tools on Android, on iOS, and Windows are all different. Mm. Uh, but what they do have in common is that they all allow the use of native C++ code, and with it, the ability to share common code in a way that's quite similar to the way we do with C Sharp and Xamarin. And that there are certainly applications and libraries that have been written in this way mm. and situations where we need to use those same libraries when we build our apps using Xamarin. Now, for example, we might have multiple native code bases that we are moving to a single Xamarin solution, mm. uh, or we might actually just have a very large, um, well-tested and performant code base that we've just deemed impractical to port to C Sharp. Um, now, Actually, if we have access to this code base, Visual Studio has some really nice tools that allow you to have the C++ and the C Sharp code uh, as part of the same solution, which gives you benefits such as a unified debugging experience. Oh, but cool. in the case of third-party libraries where we don't have access to the source code, then we end up having to take a dependency on those binaries ourselves, which is what we'll talk about today. Got it. So really, there's two scenarios. One. We have the source code, we're inside of Visual Studio or even VS Code making some code modifications. There's like some bridge code then, I guess, that has to be generated, or how would that work? Yeah, so we'll, um, I'll show you some of that in the demo, but ultimately okay. we'll be focused on using uh, pinvoke, which is short for platform invoke, in order to um, wrap that and expose it to C Sharp in a cross-platform manner. Now, bearing in mind, our goal is to do this in 20 minutes. Sure. Um, so this is going to be more of a, an introduction or a, a primer, if you will, in, in how you might think about getting started with that situation. Awesome. Yeah, you want to want to head into Visual Studio and show it off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have a solution that I've brought with me here today. And it's got three main areas. We've got the library itself, which is where we'll be bringing in our external binaries, wrapping them and exposing them in a way we can use it as part of our solution. Uh, and then we've got a unit test project, because who doesn't unit test up front? Got to have those tests. And I love it. I love it. I love it. Uh, we've got the application itself. So that's the application is not going to win any awards, but um, in essence, it just allows someone to ask for a number of items in a Fibonacci sequence, and then it just displays those to our user. So, what so it I, might be worth so, as. So what I see here, so I just want to describe it a little bit too. So just like in in Xamarin, the app has an Android and iOS head. That sample library, which has the the C++ code, that has the like an Android specific library and an iOS specific library? Is that what's happening here? Yeah, so in this particular simple example, um, I've just got for each one of these areas a shared project, mm. and that's the vast majority of where, um, where our code is. Um, so the reason we have a platform specific head is purely for the, from a testing point of view, this just allows us to run the test in a platform specific way. Got it. And the same goes for the library. Um, we, we have separate binaries per platform that we need to incorporate, and then that just allows us to do that, yet still use the library in a, in a cross-platform way. And the app itself is written in Xamarin form, so that's done for the same principle. Brilliant. I love it. So what's the, what's the next steps here? 
Yeah, so um, I think the easiest thing to do is to jump in and have a look at our unit test because this will just give us a sense of what code we've already got to work with here and then we'll look at how do we incorporate the native functionality to make this real. Um, so what we have is an instance of this class called sample funks and we use this and we ask for a Fibonacci sequence based on the length of a known good sequence that we defined earlier. And all we're going to do is make sure that the sequence we get back um, is what we'd expect it gotcha. to be. Now, if you run the unit test now, um, they'd actually fail, which is actually no surprise if we have a look at what we've got to work with. This is just a, a placeholder at the moment. Uh, quick and dirty, remember? Um, so effectively, we're just returning an empty collection, which is obviously not going to pass our test. So what we now need to do is add the libraries, wrap them, and then we'll go ahead and use that native functionality to complete this class. So this could really be any code that's out there, like, oh, I need to do something, um, and I have this C++ library that does that thing, and I want to reuse it in the app. That's the use case here. Um, yeah, exactly that. Uh, in many cases, we don't always have a choice. We're kind of given a library and say we need to use this. Got it. But, Perfect. But certainly, yes. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is add a safe handle, and that's the preferred way of working with unmanaged code from managed code. Um, so let's add a new file here, and I'm just going to call this sample funks safe handle. And what's a safe handle? Yeah, so this basically abstracts away a lot of the boilerplate code related to how we work with unmanaged resources in managed code. Um, you can think of it another way, which is it simplifies the handling of the object lifetime. So when we use this later, we won't have to implement the full disposable pattern. We can just treat it like any other managed object. Oh, cool. Um, so the way we do this, um, we can actually just um, inherit from a base class called, and wait for it, uh, safe handle uh, zero or minus one is invalid. That's quite a long Very long easy to remember. <laughs> uh, completely, exactly. But this just means that um, we don't have to write a lot of the code that we used to do uh, ah. previously. Um, so what I can do is just pass a flag through to our base class just to indicate that we own the handle here. And the other thing I have to do is override something called release handle. And that just gets called, um, and that will be where we write the code, which will effectively be releasing that resource in the unmanaged code. Now, we don't actually have our wrapper in order to call this yet, so that's what we're going to add next. And in fact, one of the things I'll do quickly is just change this from public to internal, since one of our goals is to sort of hide away all of these internals, mm -hmm. so it's a bit of a nicer, um, nicer object for it, for the um, consuming app to uh, to work with. Oh, perfect. So um, what we'll do is we'll add a new class here, and we'll call it sample funks wrapper. Um, so in this class, we're essentially declaring the functions that are implemented externally in a way that we can call uh, from the managed side. Uh, but before we do that, it's probably worthwhile um, going over and having a look at the library that we're going to be working with here. Um, so I've got a folder here called lib, which contains our library. And we have separate binaries for Android and iOS. So if we look at Android in this case, we've actually got a binary per target architecture that we want to support. And so our library in this case is called libsample. It's actually got an SO extension, which tells me it's a dynamic library in this case. And if we look at iOS, uh, we've actually got a fat binary, which means all of our target architectures are supported within the same dependency file. And that's actually got a .a extension, uh, which is telling us that's actually a static library. Now, we've got an include folder, and that gives us a bunch of headers. And this will give us some clues about you know, what, is, what are the functions that we need to call over on the managed side. So if we take a look at this, we can see there's three functions that we care about here. Uh, the first one actually is al allowing us to create the unmanaged objects. The other is to release it, which is very useful. Mm. And the main one we care about here is called get Fibonacci, which means we can pass in our handle and it will effectively work with that object for us on the unmanaged side in order to get back our sequence. So I'm just going to copy this and paste it in our wrapper here just as a quick reference before we start implementing that. Um, so there's something else that I'll do before we get going, we can turn this to internal, 
we need to have this as a static class. And actually, I should probably mention I've already taken the liberty of bringing in our native libraries. So I'm just going to open the iOS target here. And you can see I've added this as a native reference. And if I look at the properties, I've just ticked a few flags here. I've asked it to have force load and smart link. And all this is doing is saying, I want this to be linked in. And the smart link is great because it means that <laughs> it can choose to ignore this if it's <laughs> unnecessary, which means I just, <laughs> in a nutshell, I don't have to worry about why things are missing. So that's just, just that, that's just that archive file that you just showed me. So you just brought it into the Xamarin iOS library, checked a few checkboxes, and now that's going to be included in this library. That's right, exactly. Now, um, this is actually a binding library. Um, because I'm dealing with a static library, this mm. means that when I reference it, it'll handle the linking of that library in the consuming um, app target as well. Got it. Now, there's a bunch of scaffolding that comes with a binding project. Uh, there's nothing in these files. It's just we need these files for that particular project to build. Got it. Um, we can ignore that because we have a shared uh, project that has common code, really. Yeah, because the, so the, the, the libraries are the same, right? So the, the entire goal is that we're going to create this shared project that's going to have shared C Sharp kind of glue to, to, to bridge the world that then the app can consume. So even though we have an Android and iOS library, those are really just to sort of get the scaffolding and the build infrastructure in place. But everything here is, is actually shareable code between those two libraries since it's in that shared project. I exactly that. Oh, cool. um, so Android is similar. Uh, this is just a standard class library in this case. Uh, as a dynamic library, it uh, works slightly differently. But mm. effectively, we just have to follow a predefined folder structure. So we have a top-level folder called libs and subfolders for every target architecture we support. Mm. And then the appropriate library file is just you know, added within that folder. And in this case, for Android, the build action is embedded native library. Nice. Um, but that's effectively... Um, the only platform-specific configuration that we've had to do, uh, well, for my sample anyway. Yeah, it makes sense. You've got to bring in the, the C++ code at some point, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so now what we're going to do is write the code where we will effectively say, yeah, these are the native functions that we need to be able to call. Mm. And so let's do that now. And we're going to use the um, extern modifier to define those. And in this case, uh, we can see in our pasted code above, um, this is going to return us with a pointer. And let's call this by the same name as our unmanaged counterpart, just for simplicity here, if I could type at this time of night. <laughs> OK, uh, so that's going to give me a little line to say, well, I've marked this as external, but I haven't added a DLL import attribute to say where, where I can find this implementation. Um, so let's add a DLL import attribute now. So I just have to bring in the interop namespace. In fact, before we do that, um, it's probably a good time to address a slight um, difference between platforms. And in fact, more specifically in this case, Android's using a dynamic library, and iOS is using um, a static library. So I need to write some conditional code. And I try to keep this to a minimum, but let's call this DLL name. And for Android, and more specifically um, for a dynamic library, which is loaded into memory and bound to the process at runtime, it needs to know, first of all, uh, what is this file that we're working with, which is libsample.so. And in the case of iOS, then we'll do something very similar, apart from we're just going to use internal as the value which just says, actually, I should find this function somewhere in the main executable, because it's uh, all linked in. Got it. OK, that makes sense. So now we've got that. Let's just check that's picked up my, um, yeah, there we go. So effectively, we can write the rest of our code in a more universal manner as a result. So we can pass in DLL name. And the other thing we'll specify is the entry point, which is another word for it. what's the name of the function that we're calling. So in this case, uh, we've. Actually, this is one and the same. Mm. This is the same on the unmanaged as it is the managed. Um, now, you don't actually have to provide the entry point if that's the case, because it will default to use the managed name. But I prefer to be explicit. Um, that's just me. <laughs> but this is actually quite useful, because sometimes um, libraries can have names which aren't very C-sharp-like, and it just gives you the chance to provide a more friendly name. Got it. That makes sense. Now, 
before we carry on, we bothered to define a safe handle, so we might as well actually use that here instead of our um, instead of the raw pointer. And the good thing is actually we don't have to do any additional work. This gets mapped for us automatically oh. as part of the marshalling process. Oh, that's very nice. That's a nice little helper <laughs> to do that safe handle instead of just doing raw int, int pointers around. Yeah, exactly. It just means uh, we've got less to worry about oh. most of the time. <laughs> so let's go ahead and move on and we'll do the same for the release sample func function above. I'm just going to paste in here at, at risk <laughs> because um, copy and paste tends to be the devil's tool, I find. But we're just going to make sure we just name it correctly. Now this has actually got a void return type and it's going to expect us to pass in a pointer or our safe handle in this case. And lastly, let's go ahead and declare the get Fibonacci. And I can't spell Fibonacci, uh, especially hand typing, so <laughs> let's copy and paste again. Um, now, similar, this requires the handle, but in addition, it, it requires the end parameter to say how many items that it should return. And actually, in this case, um, it's actually expecting a callback. So let's actually go ahead and define what that delegate looks like up here. And we'll call this get Fibonacci. I have to concentrate when I write that. Call back. Perfect. And let's just switch back to our header files because we just want to know what does that delegate signature look like. So here we can see uh, that's going to give us a C style array mm. with an int value representing the size of that array. So we can copy and paste that so that they match up here. And then we can actually just use that uh, delegate here, complete. Perfect. Yeah, now, so, so uh, it's kind of nice that you can just reference that header file, pop some of that code over back and forth. Yeah, it's quite, it's, um, I mean, the, the example I've used is obviously very simplistic <laughs> just to make our lives easier for the next 20 minutes. But yeah, um, but yeah in principle, that's um, a good, good place to start. Um, something to point out, though, is that it's not going to work as it is. So we can't automatically marshal a C style array to a managed array unless mm. we know the size of that array up front, which actually we don't in this case. So instead, what we can do is take a pointer and we can marshal this manually in, you know, when we get the callback once we know the size of that array. Got it. So with that, um, I'm just going to get rid of temporary code here and we'll just switch back over to our safe handle. Uh, so we can complete this release handle now we actually have our wrapper. Oh, and they're all static functions, so this has the handle. You can just call that static function off of it automatically. Exactly. Thanks. Um, so I think with that, we have our wrapper. Um, so now we just have to go back to our sample funks class um, that we were working with earlier. Now this is the um, publicly accessible class that our app and unit tests have been working with to date. Now mm -hmm. we've already got the public members defined, so we just need to go ahead and update this to use our wrapper. So the first thing I'm going to do is add a backing field to store um, a reference to our safe handle. Let's call this handle. And what I want is to initialize this when the sample funks class is instantiated. Again, we can use our wrapper to say create sample funks and then it just gives us the pointer so we can then use that in subsequent calls. Got it. Now at this point, um, I'd normally be inclined to implement the disposable pattern. Um, I'd probably do a very minimalistic implementation right now since it's a demo and our object doesn't actually go out of scope in this case. Uh, but the key takeaway is we wouldn't need to implement the full pattern with finalizer and everything because we can just treat this like any other managed resource. So let's do the bare minimum disposable implementation here. And in fact, I'll just check that our handle's in a good state for me to call dispose on it. Bit of first. And let's just check that that so no, in, is invalid. That's taken care of for us by um, our base class in this case. So even less work to do. Now, obviously, the dispose tends to be a bit long-winded than this, but you know this is probably fit for the purpose right now. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, so <laughs> Final step here um, is we're going to um, 
we're going to now call the wrapper to get the Fibonacci and then we'll return our results. So let's call get Fibonacci. We'll pass in our handle and we'll pass through the end parameter from our caller and we'll just define an inline delegate here as our callback. And let's, before we forget to do this, we'll move the code that sets the result on our task completion source inside that callback. If you recall, uh, this is just going to give us a pointer. So I'm just going to declare and initialize um, an, an, a managed array. Mm -hmm. We'll call this numbers array. And I'm going to initialize this based on the size of the unmanaged array. And this is because now we can use the Marshall class to help us to um, effectively convert or copy over the values from our pointer into the managed array. Got it. So, so it's going to take that, manage, that array, the, the unmanaged array, copy everything over now that we've de declared that ahead of time. You could probably even create little helper files or things like that ahead of time to simplify this instead of doing it right here, for instance, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's one of the reasons I thought I would do a do something slightly more mm. difficult than using standard blittable types because then we have to do a little bit of extra work rather than just relying on the you know automatic um, marshalling. Um, so now that we have our numbers array, um, you probably notice we're, we're returning an I enumerable here mm -hmm. because it's well probably a bit newer <laughs> than returning a um, a raw array. So for the purposes. For our purposes here, let's just initialize our list with the uh, the numbers array. Perfect. Um, so with that, um, let's build this. And all being well, we should be able to run our unit tests, and this should all pass. Yeah, pretty cool. I mean, in, in general, there's really not that much code. It seems like the safe handle helps out a lot as far as some of the the core infrastructure of disposing and handling that, that, that memory that we usually have to do ourselves, I mean, would have to do in C++, but obviously C Sharp handles a lot of that for us. But then in general, it seems as if like this is just now looks like normal code uh, in general, and the actual wrapper isn't that much. It's really just defining those. Um, and you had to do it manually here, but I'm imagining there's maybe some tools that do that for, for us automatically, or no? Well, um, there are tools available. Um, I mean, we have to bear in mind, I've probably set some false expectations around the <laughs> typical effort involved with this because yeah. I've obviously written the library with portability in mind and, um, you know, other libraries aren't quite as kind. <laughs> yeah. However, um, you know, if you bear that in mind, so we're, you know, trying to do this in 20 minutes. So uh, if we've cut a few corners, glossed over a few concepts, <laughs> but in principle, yes, the idea, one of our goals is to make uh, the sample funks class. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, as someone using this, uh, it should feel very similar to using any other managed object. Got so it. let's run this, and there we oh. go. So that's successful. So just to wrap this up, we could set our application as the startup project and see it in action. So that little test runner is now calling the same function that would have failed before, and now it's passing, and, and now this is the full app. Look at that beautiful app. Uh, exactly. You know, design awards uh, coming my way, I'm sure. So, yep, we've got wow. 10 items, and for good measure, we'll just up this to 15 to make sure we get more items. That's uh, super cool to actually see it, right? Because the unit test is nice to, to see that it actually passes, but then when you see the actual Fibonacci come through, and you're like, wow, like, there is no Fibonacci code. It's all in that C++ library. And that could be anything. I mean, that could really be decades old C++ code that you're now using in an iOS and Android app from C Sharp, which I think is so cool. Yeah, and I think it's probably worth noting that I'm, I'm probably doing the usual trick of making it look really easy because I've written everything myself and it's really simple. Uh, but yeah, it could be quite an iterative and frustrating process. But, mm. but yeah, it's certainly something that um, you know, allows us to bring those components to bear rather than having to, to port them in yeah. many cases. Absolutely. Well, anything else you wanted to show off? It all worked. It all worked first try. It's amazing. <laughs> exactly. I know. It, who knew what could go wrong doing P invoke on a live call? <laughs> exactly. Well, I think it's great because even though it, to be honest, it, I think that example is like it's actually calling real cool code. It has some libraries. I know I've talked to a lot of developers that are like, oh, I found this really cool library that does this OCR, does this other thing, and how do I get it in there? It's like, well, just wa walk through what Mike just showed you, right? And I think we have some documentation on it too, correct? Yeah, exactly. So I think the um, Microsoft Docs, the Xamarin Docs, um, does cover 
some examples um, and that might be a good starting place if you're looking to get going with this. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, we'll put links to the documentation and I'm assuming you're going to put this code on GitHub too? Yeah, I'll put that in GitHub and we'll include that um, as part of the uh, overall package. Brilliant, Mike. Well, thank you so much for showing this off. I'm going to go write some C++ just for fun now and uh, get it into <laughs> my Xamarin app. I know, I love managing my own memory. Well, who doesn't? So. <laughs> Precisely. Well, thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on. And this is a really awesome sort of advanced topic that I think is exactly uh, what a lot of our developers sometimes need to get in, right? You're handed off this code or you're handed off this, this assembly or archive and you just need to get it in there. So thank you so much for showing it off. Not at all. Thanks yeah. for having me. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Make sure you get all of the links to the source codes, the documentation, and the show notes below. And of course, don't forget to subscribe uh, on channel nine or on YouTube and ding that bell so you get notified for all the Xamarin shows uh, and all the other shows here at Microsoft. I'm James Montemagno. This is the Xamarin Show, and thanks for watching. <laughs>